I'm Alison Verhoeven, Chief Executive of the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association. We've been around for more than 70 years and describe ourselves as the voice of public healthcare. We represent public hospitals, primary health networks, community health centres, aged care providers and a whole range of organisations that support Australians to get better access to care in the public system. On June the 11th, we were pleased to launch the Australian Centre for Value-Based Healthcare, an innovative approach to looking at different ways people across the system and organisations across the health system can work together to achieve better value for health consumers in Australia. Welcome to the launch of the Australian Centre for Value-Based Healthcare. Since the 2006 publication of Redefining Healthcare, Creating Value-Based Competition on Results by Michael Porter and Elizabeth Teesberg, health organisations around the world have been exploring how to move the focus of activities from delivering volume to delivering value. AHA has been focused on this movement for some time as well. Through the many discussions we've had, we've identified a need to bring the work that's happening around value-based healthcare across Australia into a, a, a really a defined Australian context. We believe that to achieve wide recognition and adoption of value-based healthcare in Australia, an evidence base including research and case studies and local resources has to be created here to support training, upskilling, implementation and evaluation. Our vision is that the centre will act as a hub bringing together educational and training opportunities, diverse partners. So many of you will know we are a public hospital, primary health network, community health centre based organisation, largely operating in the public part of the system. But this isn't about the public part of the system. This is a really diverse um, stakeholder group that needs to be involved in this. And that's why we've got many of you here today, insurers, medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies, private hospitals, primary health, public health acute sector, other parts of the system, we need to actually work together to truly move to a value-based healthcare system. And that needs to be underpinned by quality research and best practice training and resources, and that's why we've got academic partners here as well tonight. It's important that everybody is engaged to support this movement going forward. During the evening, we were privileged to hear from Dental Health Services Victoria, their CEO, Dr Deborah Cole, and Susan McKee, who've led a, a really transformational project around value-based healthcare to improve access to public dental services for people in Victoria. And health outcomes that matter to our patients or clients um, and it's about the cost, over the cost of what it costs to deliver those outcomes. And what we want to do is to make sure that everybody within our organisation is constantly thinking that, no matter who they are, whether they're a clinician or whether they're the person who's cleaning the floor or anything, that they are constantly turning around and going, is this adding value? Is this helping to either improve a health outcome or is it actually trying to reduce costs or is it hopefully doing both, which would be fabulous. Now the most important people along this is the consumer and we often forget why they want it changed. And so we spend a lot of time talking to consumers, um, both within our organisation, we went out to lots of people. And one of the things they um, kept coming back with was, actually, we actually don't really want your services. We actually want to be healthy. We'd prefer not to have to use them if we could. Um, but if we do need to use them, we would much prefer that um, we are part of the decision-making process. We actually developed a model of care that enabled us to figure out how do we do this differently in um, dentistry. But then we actually looked at it and went, well, that's just about the patient-facing piece. What about all the other pieces of the model that Porter and Lee talk about? So we've actually developed a framework that encompasses all those all those pieces of the puzzle but we actually put a few things extra in that we thought were really important. Probably the most important thing is the piece that Deb's talked about, the co-design piece. So we needed to make sure we co-designed A, this framework and B, our models and any of the things that we're doing with our consumers but also with our clinicians and our workforce and making sure that we've brought them on the journey with us. So that's why the consumers and the workforce co-design engagement is smack bang in the middle of our framework. 
We also looked at how do we measure outcomes and how do we measure costs, and we're still working very hard on that. Measuring costs, as we all know, in healthcare is extraordinarily difficult, or sounds very simple, but when you're trying to actually figure out exactly how long things take and how much that does cost you, um, it's actually quite complicated. 23 patient reported outcome measures um, and some other clinical measures. At the moment, we're looking at what are the patient um, experience measures that we should be measuring. Some of the things that we've achieved so far is that we've actually decreased our failure to attend. So our current failure to attend rate in general clinic runs around 18, 19%. Um, what we actually now do is run what we call an introductory session or an induction session, depending on which day of the week um, we talk about it. Language is a really interesting thing. We've changed it. We've gone to clients, not patients, because we're talking about a wellness model, but then the clinicians have reminded me, Sue, yeah, but we have a therapeutic relationship with these people, so they are patients. We've got yeah. strong clinician engagement in the small group of people that are actually working. They're working as a very tight team. So currently in dentistry, we often put the dentists over here and the therapists over there and the admin people over here. We've actually put them together as a team, trained them as a team. They've all learned the same things and they're actually an extraordinarily cohesive team. They've learned how to problem solve together. They've actually learned how to work together in a much better way. And we also had the privilege of hearing from four panellists, Professor Christabel Saunders, uh, Dr Anne Duggan, Terry Simons and Michael Pavan, all health leaders in their own right, delivering really innovative projects um, which will transform the way that health is provided and funded in Australia, improving health outcomes across disease groups like cancer, public dental health services, gastroenterology. It's a really a transformational piece of work and it was really our privilege to hear from them that night. As well as what the funder, the provider and the clinicians regard as high value. We would always put the patient as the primary determinant on top of that. What patients think is value should be our, our beacon, if you like, our navigation point. But there's no dismissing that there are four other perspectives that at a system level you actually need to consider in pursuing this. Or to actually really make a change. So often there are bright ideas in health, but you don't have the system and the ducks lined up. Uh, and I think we have much more lined up. We've done, the Commission's done work on registries. We have better data systems than we have. A lot of it, yes, is still monitoring process, but we do measure outcome, but we are doing work on um, uh, PROMs and PREMs. So I think my, my view is that this, that we have, we have almost made the environment much more fertile. I think clinicians much more understand variation now. You can have the conversation about value. So we have good data, we have a stroke registry, uh, we have uh, good evidence-based uh, models of care, uh, we have engaged clinician leaders and consumers who are involved together in a clinical network, um, and we know there are examples of where our current funding models and system arrangements get in the way of uh, good quality care. So from our point of view, I guess we're looking for candidates where we can, we can uh, make a start. Uh, orthopaedics and musculoskeletal conditions or another. Do it. So some of the big challenges have been um, around IT. That's a really, you know, how to collect the data properly, how to, how to embed the data in various hospital systems, how, how to manage that, who owns the data. That, that's probably one of our most difficult issues. Um, around collecting patient reported outcome measures, the last, when we started doing it in a little pilot, our, our researchers kind of gave me all the, the prompts and said, there you are, Christopher, you can use these in the patient consultation. Well, you know, I'm not going to use 20 pages of things. So we, you need to work out a way that the data that's collected can be fed back to the clinicians for that for that clinician patient interaction that's really meaningful and, and you have some highlights of what is important and then for the services once you start getting service-wide data how you feed that back to services so it's not a witch hunt you're not doing very well it's really how can you improve things our Diebel Institute papers explored a couple of key concepts in value-based healthcare. the first is a definition which really looked at the equation of the cost of delivering health services over the outcomes that are achieved. And this really gets to the heart of what value-based healthcare is, because we don't achieve true value only by looking at cost, but also by looking at health outcomes. 
We then put that to the test in a second Ebel Institute paper which focused on the model that Dental Health Services Victoria have used, experimenting with different funding uh, options in order to be able to improve the values achieved for their patients. This is really a transformational piece of work and will provide a great exemplar for other organisations across Australia who are seeking to bring better value to the way they deliver services. The approach that we're dealing with um, going right back to the Porter principles is about making sure that everything is working for the patient, that there are no gaps, that we are using the data that we've got to inform a better way of approaching care and organising care. So uh, more than a new fad, I think, and as we were discussing before the session started very briefly, um, it's not a funding model, it's not a policy, it's not a social movement, it's actually all of those things. And that's what makes it different to the coordinated care trials, healthcare homes, all those other things where we've tried to address some of those challenges that we've talked about today, but not in a coordinated, integrated way which is sustainable. And I think that's the big difference with this. If we do it properly, it's a sustainable approach that we just have to keep going back. And as dental services have found, when you monitor the data and you can see the clinicians starting to go back to the way they used to practice, using the data to coach, to encourage, to bring the system along in what is a better experience for the people delivering the service as much as it is for the patient. The Australian Centre for Value-Based Healthcare has a big agenda ahead of it. We want to publish uh, exemplars of great examples of value-based healthcare projects in Australia. We want to publish academic research. We'll be having many webinars and events which will inspire and stimulate conversations around doing things a little bit differently in our health system and all for better outcomes for Australians in terms of their health.